Hey everyone, I'm Justin Dean. I'm the recovery director here at the River Church. Thanks for checking out one of our messages today. We love to get connected with you and your family. One easy way to do that is to text River Connect one word to 97000, or you can visit our website at theriverchurch.cc to learn more about us and our upcoming events. If you'd like to give to the River Church today, you can text the amount you want to give to 84321, or you can visit our website and click the Give tab at the top of the page. Thanks again for joining us, and we hope you enjoy the message today. Well, good morning again, church. How are we doing? Happy New Year again, once again. I am super, super excited to be doing this with you this morning, to be here, to be up here and speaking with you this morning. I am just so joyful for this opportunity. Now, for those of you who don't know me, or um, I will reiterate, as we said, as I said in announcements, my name is Elijah Edwards, and I am our family ministry director here at the River Church in Lake Orion, which means I oversee zero to 18, so nursery, all the way through students here. And um, with that, I have the opportunity to um, see and work with kids of all ages and seeing uh, the Lord move uh, through them. And speaking of which, I know uh, some of you maybe today have seen Um, This tie and this green clashing on blue with this tie. Well, um, this isn't just a green tie. Uh, If you look closely, uh, you'll see it has little green circles uh, with faces on them and then a random carrot. But eagle-eyed viewers and those who had an absolutely rocking childhood as I did, you'll see that it's the the French peas from VeggieTales. Uh, My parents got me this tie uh, for Christmas. If you don't know the French peas, you know, the keep walking, but you will knock down that song, that song. So, um... I love this tie. I love that my parents got me this. Um, I even joked, is this from a random Christian bookstore that's, that's up, that's still up and still running? So um, I really, really love this tie. And this tie tends to remind me of um, my childhood, not only just my childhood, but some of the first encounters I had with Jesus as a child. So when I look back at those moments, I remember how cool and exciting it was to learn about the Bible in such fun ways And also finding out that Jesus died for me and rose again so that way I can be with him in heaven. But when I look back as well and look at those moments, I have to think for a moment. When I look back and remember how cool those are, how cool all those things were, I also realize how much I started to lose that same excitement as I got older and got, you know, turned into an adult. How jaded and bogged down by life I started to become, and to be honest, still am a little bit. So I want you to think about that for this moment as I, as I uh, spoke about that, that. Think about the ways you looked at things as a child. The ways that you looked at things when you were younger. and the, Not only as a child, but even the ways you looked at things in your relationship with Jesus when you first encountered Jesus. When you first had that moment with Jesus. What differences are there? How do you handle Christ being Lord over your life now than when you made that commitment to him? We are all grown up now, yet we are still God's children. And how are his children supposed to be and supposed to act? But before we get more into that, let us pray. Father God, we love you and we thank you um, for this ability to be here, to be together, to worship you, to, cl- uh, to glorify you and declare that you are Lord, that you are great, And that we love you so very much. And I pray this morning that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart are acceptable in your sight. For you are my strength and my redeemer. Amen. So when I was pondering these questions myself, when I was looking over these questions as I was writing this, I remember and remembered a term that I've heard plenty of times that I'm sure a lot of you have heard before, and that's childlike faith. Now, when looking back at this, I was just wondering where this term originated, um, what does this term mean fully, and what does this mean to have, what does it mean to have childlike faith? And for those answers, of course, uh, we have to look at scripture as where all answers are. And today we are going to begin in the book of Matthew chapter 18. So if you have your Bible, if you have your phone with you, you can turn to Matthew chapter 18. We will be looking at verse 1 first. So to set the scene of Matthew chapter 18, um, 
We see that Jesus uh, and his disciples, they were just, in the previous chapter, they were just in a city called Capernaum, a village called Capernaum, which was a fishing village in Galilee. And uh, that's where Peter and Jesus were discussing uh, the temple tax. And Jesus had just performed a miracle where a fish was, he had a coin in its mouth that Peter had fished out to, help, to go towards the tax that they were meant to pay. Now that's a pretty awesome thing for him to do in the previous chapter, but what he does here in this next chapter is even more profound. So as I read here in verse 1, at that time the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? So I'm going to pause here for a moment because when I was reading this passage, I want to read up on some commentary on this passage. And I was pointed to the same encounter in, the chapter, in Luke chapter 9, verse 46. And in this chapter, in Luke's gospel, it says beforehand, an argument arose among them as to which of them was the greatest. See, I love this perspective, because not only are the disciples just going, hello, Jesus, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? They're arguing amongst themselves, bickering with themselves, and finally one of them is like, you know what, we're just going to go ask Jesus. We'll go ask Jesus who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So I just really love that, because it just adds so much personality to the situation. So you have to ask, why were they arguing? Why were they arguing this question? When looking at this question and researching more into the commentary, what I saw was the disciples were trying to see who would have the highest position in this new kingdom that Jesus was making. They were thinking in the sense of like a modern, like a modern, but more and more of their time, a monarchy. You, know, you have the king, you have the lords of the king, you have people appointed to the king. But Jesus wasn't thinking in a worldly mindset. His kingdom was going to be different. So following that question of who would be the greatest, Jesus answers the question in verse 2 and 3. So he called a little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. What? And I say what like that because that's what I imagine the disciples were thinking. Jesus' answer to the disciples must have been so left field because while they're, remember, they're thinking in a hierarchy. They're thinking who's going to be best, who's going to be greatest, what can they do to become the greatest? Jesus shows them a child and says, be like this child. And the reason this is so crazy to them and the disciples is because in their day, children were unheard, unseen, unimportant, and quite frankly, treated as property at times. For one, I love moments when Jesus just blows the doors off society or blows the disciples' minds, because he does that to us all the time. We think one way, and then Jesus says something, and we're like, that's not at all what I was thinking, but okay. But I also love this, is because Jesus, what Jesus is actually getting at here. So we continue on into verse 4 and 5. Herefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. Now this isn't the only time that Jesus has sort of reinforced or referenced a uh, switch like this. The, the lowest will be the greatest. Of course, in Matthew chapter 20, verse 16, it reads, So the last shall be first, and the first last. But Jesus is telling him them something really, really important, but really profound. You see, if we really want an answer as to who the greatest in the kingdom of heaven is, it's Jesus. But Jesus is answering through his own nature. He calls a child over who, when you read this and read this passage, doesn't seem to hesitate to run to Jesus. He tells his disciples who are doing everything in their power in that moment to be heard, to be seen, to see who will be the greatest, wanting the highest position in this new kingdom, that to even enter the kingdom, they must be like a child. Unheard and unseen. Completely turning what they thought on its head. 
Now, while we look at this passage some more and think about it, I want us to think of what a child is, first and foremost. Now, what I have written down on here, I didn't come up with myself, because my brain, being the children's director, I was like, children are small. Children are noisy. Children are messy. (laughs) But what the commentary spoke about is just things that I wasn't thinking in that moment. Here's some of the things here. Children are non-threatening. You aren't exactly going to be intimidated by a two-year-old in a dark alley going, oh, I'm gonna get fly. You know, you're not gonna be intimidated by someone like that. But another thing is children are not good at deceiving. See, I love this one. Because if any of you have interacted with children before, they are the worst liars in the world. They just cannot tell a good lie whatsoever. They come up with something on the spot and you're like, uh-huh, okay, yeah, sure, that's the totally a lie. They are innocent, which means they're not tainted by the world. They aren't aren't, um, exposed to the knowledge that we have as adults. They are wide-eyed and hopeful and are amazed at some of the smallest things sometimes. I mean, I love it when, you know, they're trying to impress us and they're like, hey, hey, look at this. And you're like, yay, good job. You did such a good job. But I have a question to sort of ask you about this. As we laugh at these and we, you know, we get quite a chuckle out of how kids act. I want you to think, are you any of these things? Because being each of these things is being like a reflection of Jesus. Jesus wasn't threatening. He was gentle. He was kind. He was not intimidating. He wasn't deceitful never once told a lie. He was innocent of everything that he was crucified for. The creator of the universe, the Lord of lords, kings, king of kings, was humble. And he is the model of that humility. Coming down in the form of a baby, growing up in a lowly position of a carpenter, serving others, healing and allowing himself to be hung on a cross and tortured when he had the power, the authority, the position, and the right to stop all of it from happening. But he continued through it for us as an example to us. And he tells us in Matthew to be humble like a child. What does that mean for us? What does that look like for us. A child has no other option but to be humble, regardless of how much they don't want to be. Depending on the age of the child, or depending on the child, they can't dress themselves properly. They can't make their own food, or at least not trusted to make their own food. They can't acquire their own shelter or place of living. They rely on their parents or guardians for everything. They rely on them for all things. Just the same as we must rely on Jesus for all things. But you see, when we grow up, when a child grows up, we become an adult and we can dress ourselves, at least, sort of. We can make our own food. We can provide our own shelter and place of being. We no longer need help. But how many times do we do that same exact thing? Even though we don't need our help from our parents anymore, how many times do we do the exact same thing to God? We act like the disciples trying to become heard and seen important. We're important in our lives. We are, we are here. We, it's mine now. It's my life. I got this. Putting ourselves and our wants and needs in front of God's. Being the greatest in our own personal kingdom. So I'll give you an example. In high school, I loved being at church. Um, I was at our church building, and you can ask my father. It was 24 hours on a weekend. Probably spent more time doing that than actually working on schoolwork. And I loved to serve. I loved to work in the church, but my mind got clouded with thoughts of how important I must have looked to the church leaders 
to the other adults, to my friends, how important I was. I was doing all these things, and yeah, I'm working for God. I'm awesome. I'm going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Or even now, while writing this sermon, thinking, I wonder how much this will impress the elders. My mind getting clouded with some of those thoughts. Wanting to be more important. We want to be seen, to be important, to be heard. But throughout that, there is one that hears us and does see us. And that's Jesus. So we'll look at Luke chapter 18. So if you want to turn that to your Bibles, we're looking at verses 15 through 17. It reads, now they were bringing even infants to him that he might touch them. And when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them to him, saying, let the children come to me and do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. And truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. So again, in, verse, in that last verse, he's reiterating, whoever does not accept the kingdom like a child will not enter it. So to set the scene, we see families bringing their children, or in this case, infants, to Jesus. And the disciples are saying, no, rebuking them. Jesus has more important things to do. Get those children away. But Jesus calls them over with open arms, wanting the children near him, and telling the disciples that if they do not accept the kingdom like these children, they will not enter it. Jesus was not too important for these children. He loved and prioritizes them just as he loves us. So we started in the beginning of this talking about childlike faith and what it means to have it. And Jesus is answering here that faith like a child is to first and foremost be humble. Not aiming to be the most seen or trying to gain some high status. Not putting ourselves first, but putting Christ first. Knowing fully and believing that when we are afraid, When we are sad, when life is hard, and when things are just not going our way, we know we rely on the strength of Jesus. So with that, there are are many songs we sing in the children's area on a Sunday or a Wednesday night. And um, I wanted to share a chorus from one of those songs, and bear with me, I won't do a dance move with it while it's it's going along or try to sing it. But this song is from... Um, a VBS group that's called Group, um, and they put on a very big VBS program. And the lyrics go, I've got to think, think, think about the goodness of you, my God, because I know, 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 no matter how I feel, I've got to trust in you, and I want to trust in you. See, as kiddy and as simple as those lyrics sound, that's childlike faith. Putting yourself in a humble, lowly position that you're sad, you're afraid, you're angry, but you're relying on Jesus with those things. Trusting in him as a child, trust its parents for all things. Trust and rely on Jesus in all things. Taking yourself off that pedestal and humbling yourself before the Lord. Now before I close out here, I have a story to share with you. When I was a junior in high school, I was a teacher for our five-year-old's class. So go figure, now I'm doing this, so it all leads up. And I had a little boy named Alex in my class. And after he had finished the Bible story, after we had finished the Bible story, we were uh, in the room, we had our snack, we finished the Bible story, um, he looked a little sad. So I told the the other teacher, just uh, go let the other kids in the room, let's play. I'll talk with Alex here real quick. And I said, hey, bud, what's, what's going on? And he said, I'm sad. And I say, okay, what, what, are you, what are you sad about? What's going on? So I kneeled down to him, and he says, well, I, I just found out that Jesus had died. And in my brain, I'm thinking, well, bud, there's, there's more to the story. But I look at him, and I say, oh, well, did you know that three days later, he he rose again, and he's, he, he's, he's, he's alive again. That way we can be with him in heaven. He looks at me, and he's like, really? With these gigantic eyes, just so excited. And I'm holding back tears at this moment, and I say, yeah, and whenever you want to, 
you can go over and you can, you can talk with him. You can pray with him. So he does. He goes to the corner of the room and he begins thanking Jesus for right, raising again and dying for him. That he could be with him in heaven. And if that doesn't scream hallelujah, I don't know what does. In that moment, that five-year-old boy had more faith in Jesus than I had as his teacher that entire week, month, or even year. He had more faith than I did. He was able to humble himself down and talk with Jesus with nothing as a distraction. So this question I leave you with as we close is that for those of us who have a relationship with Jesus, are you acting as his child? Are you humbling yourself before him? Are you relying on him for all things? Or are you still wanting control over things of your life? And for those of you who don't know Jesus and are wondering what that looks like, I'm asking you, are you ready to humble yourself before the Lord? Are you ready to kneel down in front of the cross and accept that you are a sinner, you can't do this alone, and that you need his saving? Because we're all sinners. We all need his saving. We all can't do this alone. We need Jesus. Just as a child needs a parent, we need our Father in heaven. For our life, for our soul, for everything. Because as the song says, we can trust in him no matter how we feel, no matter what's going on, we can trust in him and rely on him and he will never forsake us. So humble yourself. Humble yourself before the Lord. Become unheard and unseen like a child and know that he has it. He is the greatest. And become like a child. Let's pray. Father God, we... Thank you again for today. And we thank you for this time that we can know that we can rely on you for all things. That no matter what is happening in life, no matter what may be bogging us down, that we don't try to go it in alone, we don't try to just be heard, and we don't try to act as if we can be great, as if we can earn these things, that we know that everything goes through you, that our lives go through you, and that you are Lord and Savior and Lord over our life. So if any of us hear that we are, we are feeling we need to give those things up, I pray that you put it upon their hearts to do that, that you, can say, that you can say, hey, I can take this. You don't have to hold on to this. And for those of us who don't know you, that are seeking a relationship with you, are trying to find ways that we can get through this life, we know that we can give all things. We pray that they know they can give all things to you, that they come before you humbly and say, Father, Jesus, I need your help. I need your help in these things and I need your help to be Lord over my life because I can't take these things anymore and I can't rely on these, I can't rely on myself to bear these things anymore. We love you. In your son's name we pray.